Welcome to the New Institute series, Discovering Servant Leadership. So far in this series, we've provided a biblical framework for a life of Christian leadership and discussed faith, love, and service as the foundation for that life. We examined the power model of leadership, which Jesus rejected, and the service model, which embodies the teachings of Jesus. We looked at the characteristics of servant leaders and the key practices of servant leaders. Then we took a look at organizational communities and institutional operating principles. In this lecture, we'll be discussing leading the change process in organizations. Leading change can be a challenge. It requires courage, wisdom, compassion, and humility. It can lead to a very complex process. It can give rise to serious disagreements. People may disagree on the facts, on the values to be applied, on the goals to be reached. Usually there are arguments between the head and the heart. A change that seems intellectually acceptable may be hard to accept emotionally. It's also hard to predict all of the, the uh, results of a change process. Usually there are unintended consequences. There are many reasons for leading a change process. An organization may be failing and it must change in order to survive. Uh, an organization may be growing and that means they have to learn how to do things in new ways. Uh, an organization may seek change in order to serve its customers and its employees better. Most organizations uh, must change because the world around them is changing and employees and leaders are coming and going. We know that in terms of external factors, there are changes in socioeconomic conditions, political trends, governmental regulations, technology, and the natural environment. Organizations are affected by changes in terms of competitors and changes in terms of the markets in which they provide their products and services. So there are a lot of external factors pushing the change process. There are also internal factors. People come and go in organizations. Turnover is a fact of life. It's estimated that in 2017, 18.5% of all employees in the United States, on average, turned over. And when it comes to CEOs, the turnover rate's pretty high as well. In 2015, it was estimated that 17% of the CEOs of the world's biggest public companies left their firms that year. As a result of turnover, employees find that they are experiencing new work assignments and new relationships with other team members. Uh, they may be asked to, to do new things, a, a new workspace, a new work location, a new work environment. Um, perhaps now they need to exercise uh, more initiative, more leadership, and learn new skills. Well, those are big changes for the employees involved, and it, those changes can have impact on their families as well. People typically resist change. It's just hard for people to stop doing things the way they're used to doing them, even when they know that there may be a better way. Also, the change process usually takes time, more hours of work, because you've got to keep the organization running while you're learning the new systems and the new processes that are being put in place. People also fear that while the change may be good for the whole organization and the people it serves, it may not be good for their specific job or career. So the change process can result in a lot of pain and stress for individual employees. That is why you should never, ever launch a change process unless it's truly required, unless it's really necessary. People should not be put through the pain and stress unless it really will result in an organization that is better able to serve its mission, its employees, its customers, and society at large. There are some really important questions that I think should be asked by the organization when you're launching a change process, questions about what's the higher purpose? Is this what God is calling us to do? Will this change really help us to fulfill our mission and our vision? Is it consistent with our values? Will this change help us to serve our customers better? Will this change help us to serve each other better? Will this change help us to lay a strong foundation so that we can continue to serve others far into the future? Those are important questions that need to be asked and answered by the organization. There are fundamental questions to ask when leading change. What do we think needs changing? Why? Who will lead the change? Who can be expected to follow? What will the internal context be like? What will the external context be like? Servant leaders ask these questions and seek out the answers.
When seeking to understand the impact that a change will have on others, servant leaders understand that people have different experience with change. Some people find change to be easy and some are not used to it at all. It's hard. I could use myself as an example. I'm, I'm used to change. I, I grew up in six different states. New York, Nebraska, California, Virginia, Rhode Island, Hawaii. I went to nine schools in 12 years. Uh, I, I went to six different universities. I lived in three foreign countries for seven years, two years in England, two years in Japan, three years in Singapore. When my wife and I got married, we lived in six dif different places during the first seven years of our marriage. Over the last 40 years, I've worked for nine organizations, and they've been in the public sector, the private sector, the uh, nonprofit sector, and the academic sector. So I'm kind of used to change. But other people have very different backgrounds. We vary in our experience of change, and we vary in our tolerance for change. However, even if we have the same backgrounds, a change will not affect each of us the same way. A change that's a big change for some people may be a small one for others. For example, if the organization decides to move its headquarters from one side of town to the other, that will be a big change for some people, but a very small change for others. If an organization decides to embark on a special project that requires a lot of overtime, that can be a problem for people who need to leave on time to get their kids to soccer practice, but not a big problem for those who don't have that type of family obligation. If an organization decides to discontinue a program or a product, that will obviously affect the people involved in that program or product while having little or no impact on anybody else. So we vary in our experience of change, and specific changes affect us differently. Servant leaders keep all of that in mind. I have learned that in general, people are willing to change when they are consulted, when they understand the need for change, when they know what the change is about, when they have the time and resources to make the change, and when they are kept informed during the change process. However, I have been in situations where people intellectually support the change process, but when we begin to implement it, they complain or even attack. The attacks may be even very bitter. Sometimes we can understand intellectually the need for the change, but when the change begins, it just doesn't feel good. Something that we agree to intellectually may be followed by emotional pain. This is when it's really important for the servant leader to love his or her colleagues. People are grieving. People are losing something. The old ways are dying. People need compassion. They need patience and support from their leader during the change process. Even if people are not grieving, they often have doubts. A change process can take months or even years. Uh, it's very common that during a change process, people will begin to wonder, what was it that we were trying to accomplish? Why are we going through this change? You see, the benefits of the change probably haven't started accruing yet. People are just feeling the costs, the, the extra hours of work, the pain, the stress, the confusion. Compared to those costs, the past is beginning to look pretty good. What were we thinking? Really, what were we thinking? Well, this issue goes back at least as far as Moses. Now, Moses led the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt on a journey to a new land, the land of milk and honey. You would think that the Israelites would be overjoyed to be free and to be on that journey. But that's not what the Bible tells us. According to the Bible, the Israelites had their doubts from the very beginning. From the very beginning, they wondered, why did Moses lead us out in the desert to die? Back in Egypt, we had food in our pots. They kept referring to things being better back in Egypt. So they complained, they resisted, they even went astray. Moses was a, a great prophet, leading his people on a journey of great historical and religious importance. But even for him, even with all the miracles that God showed them, leading change was not easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus either. He came to teach a new way of living and loving, a new way of relating to God, a new way of being God's people a new way of understanding the kingdom of God. The crowds didn't get it. They wanted him to be an earthly king. Sometimes the disciples didn't get it either. They didn't want him to go to Jerusalem. 
They didn't want him to, God, to, to die. They didn't, they didn't want God's plan. When they prayed with him in the Garden of Gethsemane, they, they couldn't stay awake. And when he was arrested, they just dispersed. Peter denied him three times. But that wasn't the end of the story. In fact, we know the story never ends. Jesus changed the world, and Christ reigns. If it was that hard for Moses and Jesus, we should not be surprised that it's hard for us. We need to have empathy for our colleagues who are going through the change process. We need to acknowledge their doubts. We need to stay with them, listening and encouraging. We need to remind them of the benefits that will eventually be achieved if we stay on course and we stay together. There are a number of reasons that servant leaders are good at leading change. They won't take advantage of a change process to build their own power and position. They're not going to make changes based on personalities or factional battles or uh, rivalries within the organization. They're just going to look at what does the organization need to do to improve and better serve its employees or its customers. Another reason that servant leaders are good at leading the change process is that they're team leaders. They invite and support other members of the team. They're, they're open to the ideas and, and talents and leadership of others. They help everyone to make their highest and best contribution to the organization. Another reason that servant leaders are good at leading change is that they try to build the organization's community. And that helps the organization to stay together during the change process. Uh, there are even cases in which that organizational community deepened its commitment. Employees became more committed to each other, to the organization, and to their customers during the process. Most important, I think, when talking about leading change, servant leaders are good at being shepherds. They really understand the need to pay attention to the emotional and spiritual state of their colleagues who are going through the change process with them. They also pace the change process so that the community can adjust and manage it. And they're constantly consulting to stay in touch with people so that they can better adjust the change process as needed. I want to talk about this consultative approach. The consultative approach uh, is designed to make decisions in a timely manner uh, in a way that they can be implemented as effectively as possible. So the idea is to get input from a lot of different places and then make a decision that's truly appropriate that other people are willing and able to implement. Back in the 1970s, I uh, worked for part-time for a securities company in Tokyo. And I became interested in how the Japanese and Americans negotiated and made deals. What I learned was that the Japanese were slow to make a decision because they involved their teams. But then when it came time to implement the decision, they were very fast because everyone on the team understood the situation, they understood what needed to be done, and they were ready to go. The Americans, on the other hand, were quick to make a decision because they didn't involve their teams. But then they, were, they, they had difficulty implementing because the teams didn't understand what was happening and they were not ready to go. Some uh, were even uh, disappointed they'd been left out of the negotiation, so they dragged their feet or even tried to sabotage the deal. That's why servant leaders don't issue orders. They don't just send the memo. They know that people receiving the memo may not understand it, that they may not have the time or ability or resources to do what's requested, and they may even decide that they don't really want to do it. Servant leaders use a consultative approach instead. Now, that approach is somewhere between the autocratic approach and the democratic approach. Uh, the autocratic approach would be a person just making the decision by himself or herself. And that can lead to bad decisions if the autocrat doesn't listen and doesn't have very much information. People may even resist the decision because they were left out. The democratic approach is necessary for our political lives, but it may not work well in an organization because the majority only needs 51%. And they may feel they can ignore the ideas and concerns of the other 49%. But those ideas and concerns may be absolutely crucial when it comes to implementing the decision. So in the consultative approach, the, the servant leader tries to get all the information possible, ideas, concerns, issues, pro and con that relate to the decision. Uh, by getting all those views, it's possible to make a decision that can be implemented 
because it maximizes the positive benefits and minimizes the negative. Even people who assume that consultation is good will say, but there are limits. I mean, during an emergency, uh, a leader has to be decisive and add quickly without stopping to ask other people for input. I mean, there just isn't time. Well, I understand that during an emergency, people may not be available to provide input, but if they are, it's still worth asking for that input. Let me tell you why. In his book, Leading Change, James O'Toole talks about cockpit simulations that were run by the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, back in the 1970s. They put three crew members into a simulator, a flight simulator, uh, in order to um, try to judge their effectiveness in responding to computer-generated crises. I mean, a hypothetical air traffic control problem or equipment failure or bad weather and so on. What they noticed was that some pilots immediately started barking out orders, while other pilots would turn to the other two members of the crew and ask for their input. Now, there was no question that in every case, the pilot was in charge. The pilot was going to make the decision. It's just that some pilots consulted and others did not. And the research showed, beyond a doubt, that the best decisions were made by the pilots who consulted. They went out and looked at the real-life data of real crises that had occurred and concluded that in almost every situation, the crew will have 30 seconds to act. And it only takes five to 15 seconds to ask two questions and get two responses, leaving the pilot another 15 seconds to make a better decision, a decision that could save lives. So even in a crisis, even when there really isn't time, it's still worth asking for input. One of the most dramatic stories I've ever heard about leading change is the story of the Delphi brake assembly operations in Dayton, Ohio. Back in 2006, uh, they were told that they would be closing their doors in 2008. They had 1,600 employees, and they were going to all be losing their jobs. Um, the plant, the business had been sold to another company. They needed the two years to build their own plant, hire and train their own employees, um, so the business would shut down for sure in 2008. Well, employees were, were angry. I mean, some of them had worked for GM and Delphi for, for decades. Um, many of them quit immediately, hundreds uh, left right away, so their replacements had to be hired and trained. The challenge was they had to keep producing high-quality brakes for two years, up until the last day before their plant was closed. Uh, and these are brakes. I mean, they have to produce a million assemblies of brake components per month, and they have to be high-quality because the safety of each car depends on it. That high-quality had to be achieved by people who knew that all of them were going to lose their jobs in two years. Tom Green was the plant manager, and Mary Miller was the human resources manager for the Dayton operations. And it's been my, my privilege to, to meet them, chat with them, and to learn their story firsthand. They told me that uh, the corporate headquarters told them that they had no ready-made plan to help them deal with the closure. So they were on their own. Well, that was a blessing because then they could face the crisis by doing what they had always wanted to do, which is apply servant leadership principles. They picked four. First principle, listen, don't talk. Second principle, ask employees, what do you need? Third principle, set aside time every day for foresight and planning. Fourth principle, ask, do those served grow as persons? They didn't want everybody to focus on the fact that they were going to be losing their job in two years. Everyone knew that. They wanted the employees to focus on how to make the best use of that two years to prepare themselves for getting their next job. So they sat down with the employees and said, how can we make the best use of this time for you? Would you like more training? Would you like to finish a college degree? Would you like job rotation to, to expand your resume? They came up with an individual development plan for each employee. And they, they checked every few months to make sure that the plan was being implemented. They did many different things to manage this crisis, but the individual development plans were a real key to their success. And it was a dramatic success. They became one of the safest manufacturing plants in the United States. Their defect rate was single digits, nine parts per million or less. 
their on-time delivery was 99.5%. And they cut their costs by $160 million, making them the most profitable they had been in decades. On their last day, they were the best they had ever been. Servant leadership was the reason. One of the key practices of servant leaders is to grow people. In their book, um, Choosing Change, Goldsworthy and McFarlane said that developing people is a key factor in a successful change effort. By the way, they said that that change effort should begin with the leader. The leader should be willing to change his or her own behavior. If the leader is not willing to change, how can the leader expect everybody else in the organization to be willing to change? A good example is Captain Michael Abrashoff. Captain Abrashoff became the commander of the USS Benfold in 1997. It was a time in which the Navy was experiencing a lot of problems with retention. Sailors were, were leaving at very high rates. Morale on the Benfold um, was bad. When the previous commander left, they stood there cheering his departure. The Benfold was arguably the worst performing ship in the Navy. A year later, after Captain Avashoff took command, they were rated number one in the fleet with the same crew, with the same crew. At first, Captain Avashoff wasn't sure how to turn the situation around. Oh, yeah, he knew about command and control, but he also knew that hadn't worked for his predecessor. So he decided to just sort of watch and listen. And after a while, he concluded that if he wanted to improve retention, he needed to change the lives of these sailors, but he needed to start by changing his own life first. He needed to become a very different kind of leader. So instead of exercising power or barking orders, he sat down with each member of the crew, one by one, just to, to talk and to get to know them and to ask them for their advice. It's your ship, he'd say. How would you make things better? He began to delegate more and more the, the running of the ship to other people. Oh, and he also set up a, a learning center so that sailors could uh, do some college-level courses by long distance. Captain Abrashoff said that the only way to achieve his goals, combat readiness, retention, trust, was to help his people to grow. And it worked. The Benfold set all kinds of records for retention and performance, and the waiting list of crew and officers who wanted to transfer to the Benfold was pages long. One reason the waiting list was so long was that people didn't want to leave the Benfold, so vacancies weren't occurring. Captain Abrashoff started a change process by changing himself, and then worked to help others to change as well. And it was a great success. Earlier, I mentioned three different situations that may require a change process. An organization may be failing and must change in order to survive, or an organization may be growing and doing things differently, uh, or uh, an organization may decide that it can serve better. It needs to change in order to improve its service. I'd like to talk a little bit about each of these different situations because I think leading change in those situations does differ. First is the organization that's failing and needs to change in order to survive. There are so many reasons that a failing institution can be failing. One is simple denial, a refusal to face reality. Another is that leaders may not have the courage to make the hard decisions that need to be made, like cutting positions and programs and then reallocating resources to areas of greater promise for the future. Another reason may be that nostalgia for the past is so strong that a significant number of people in that organization would rather that it did close its doors instead of changing in order to survive. Another reason is that the organization may have lost track of its mission. Many years ago, I worked with a friend and colleague, Dr. Ed Cormandy, to do a research project. We decided to do research on presidents of colleges and universities who had turned their campuses around so they didn't have to close their doors. We wanted to know what did they find, what, what were the problems, and what did they do about it. We uh, identified 36 presidents who had led turnarounds, and we surveyed them, collected data from them. And what we learned was that 31 of the 36 came upon the same major issue, which was their institutions did not know where they were going. They had simply lost focus and direction. 
So we asked them, what did you do? Well, they did a lot of things at the beginning, but long term, they focused on strategic planning and restructuring their senior management. Once they knew where they needed to go, they needed new people to, to go there with them. One of the sad things about uh, change at, when an institution is failing is that the people who got the institution into trouble may not be the people who can get the institution out of trouble. New leadership is needed. If a servant leader is one of the new people invited into the situation, he or she will probably find that the problems and the solutions are pretty obvious. The challenge is to get people to accept reality, to understand their situation, and then to adopt a realistic action plan so they can respond effectively. Implementing that kind of action plan does require courage and persistence, a thick skin, a lot of compassion, a relentless focus on the mission, and a renewed commitment to those the organization is serving. An organization that's growing has a different set of problems. The challenge may be that the organization has grown beyond its original organizational structure. But often the problem is that the organization has grown beyond the leadership capacity of the founder and the early leaders. Many organizations are the dream of an individual, the founder, who risks his or her time and resources to get the organization going. A few other people may join because they also are committed to the mission. It's a, it's a small team. Uh, interaction uh, is, is constant. Uh, there is little formal structure. Uh, the business starts in the garage or living room of the founder. And the team lives on passion, prayer, hope, and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Uh, those are exciting early days, referred to later as the good old days. Then success comes, and new people need to be hired, and the garage or living room isn't big enough anymore, so office space needs to be rented. People don't see each other as often as they used to. Communication systems have to be set up. Meetings have to be scheduled. Rules have to be adopted. And there's the first hint of office politics. Still, the founder and the early leaders are leading the effort, and they're still involved in all the decisions. But growth continues to the point where the founder and the original team can't make all the decisions. At that point, some entrepreneurs will sell the business and go back to their garage or living room and start another one. A servant leader will decide to share decision making and support the development of other leaders. So the servant leader can still be involved. But if the founder is not a servant leader, it becomes difficult. The founder is not a servant leader, he or she doesn't want to give up control, he will not delegate decisions to other people, which means that now they are limiting the growth of the organization. That's called the founder's syndrome. And it's sad because unless that founder resigns uh, or is forced out of the position, the organization really won't grow. It's the kind of situation that leaves deep scars. The third situation is an organization that's not failing or growing. It's an organization where things are really all right, but then that makes it hard to get people to accept the need for change. John P. Cotter has written a number of books about leading change, and he says, you know, the, the first step in leading a change process is to establish a sense of urgency. He tells a story of a company that had decentralized uh, the purchasing process so that each of its factories had their own supplier and, and their own purchasing uh, situation. The company's purchasing managers really felt that if they centralized the process, they could save the company $1 billion over five years. The problem is, that's a really big change, and there was no sense of urgency. One of the purchasing managers asked a, a summer student, an intern, uh, to do a little research. He said, would you go and find out how many different kinds of gloves are used at all of our factories? Well, she did the research and she came back and said, well, there are 424 different kinds of gloves being used at our factories, uh, and the same gloves are being sold at different prices. So the purchasing team gathered samples of each glove, all 424, and they took them into the boardroom and they stacked them in a big pile. And then they invited all the division presidents to come in and look at the pile. And the division presidents were shocked. Here's this big pile of gloves. And they could see that sometimes the same glove was sold for $3 or $5 or $10, variation. Well, they got the point. And that pile of gloves had been moving around the company, being used as a way to try to create a sense of urgency and explain to people why centralized purchasing could be an advantage. 
Joe Patterncheck led a change process at the Cleveland Clinic where he introduced servant leadership principles. Joe had done HR work in the high-tech industry, but he felt God calling him to accept the Chief of Human Resources position at the Cleveland Clinic back in 2007. The Cleveland Clinic is one of the most respected healthcare systems in the world. They have 40,000 employees, three and a half million patient visits from citizens of more than 100 countries. Um, US News and World Report usually rates them as one of the top four healthcare systems in the United States. But not all was well back in 2007. Joe tells his story in his book, The Engaged Enterprise. He said that he knew that people would not get behind change unless they were dissatisfied, unless there was that sense of urgency. So he commissioned a survey on employee engagement and found that employee engagement was poor. Then there was a survey on patient satisfaction that, re that revealed that while clinical results were superior, the overall patient experience was average. Well, this led to real dissatisfaction among the leaders at Cleveland Clinic, and they committed to a major program to improve employee engagement. Joe suggested they focus on making the clinic a great place to work. They started with a program titled, We Are All Caregivers. The message was that everyone who, who interacted with the patient could affect the patient's experience, not just doctors and nurses. The patient's experience could be affected by the people who maintained the facilities, the people who worked in the kitchen, the people who checked in the patients, the people who walked people to their cars when, when they were going home. Then they started a program where they pulled people from different levels and functions of the clinic together for three-hour discussions of the mission and values. Then Joe introduced servant leadership as the leadership model. Within two years, 3,000 leaders were trained in servant leadership. They started a program called Caring for the Caregivers, a whole series of employee benefits. Now, my favorite benefit was the wellness program. They decided to give all their employees free access to Weight Watchers and Curbs. More than 12,500 employees participated, and they lost 75,000 pounds. That, by the way, saved the Cleveland Clinic $78 million on health care costs. The change process required a deep commitment because there was resistance at every stage to every new program. It also required a long-term commitment because evidence of improving em employee engagement didn't start appearing in the surveys for two years. But after five years, the ratio of engaged to disengaged employees rose from a dismal 2.5 to 1 to a world-class 10.5 to 1. Patient satisfaction also improved dramatically. It was a tremendous success, and servant leadership was a big reason. In summary, there are many reasons for leading change. An organization may be failing or growing or may decide to improve its service. External forces and internal turnover can cause change. People vary in their experience with change, and individuals can be affected differently by specific changes. Even when the need for the change is clear, employees may suffer pain, stress, or confusion. Change can be successful if the leader is a servant leader, a shepherd who consults with others and truly cares about the emotional and spiritual health of all the team members throughout the change process. Does anybody have a question? Uh, you mentioned some tremendous books as resources, uh, and I was just curious, what would be your favorite book or favorite books 
on leading change? You know, there are a lot of good ones, and they, they, um, they each have something to offer. I would say my favorite one is the one I mentioned by Harold and Fedor, um, Change the Way You Lead Change, because to me it was, was very realistic about engaging everybody in the change process. I think too many of the books just assume that the person at the top of the organization is going to issue an order and the change will, will take place, and that's not been my experience. <laughs> my experience is you really need to, to connect with people. Questions like, you know, uh, why are we changing, and who's going to lead the change, what resources do they need, what are the impacts going to be? Uh, I think those are the right, right questions. So change the way you lead change would be my, my first choice. Thank you. How about another question? And Dr. Keith, what would you recommend for becoming a servant leader? Wow. I, I think that the very first step of becoming a servant leader for us in a Christian context is, is faith is understanding what scripture says, uh, what Jesus said about how we are to lead uh, and how we are to be servants first. So I think it starts with that. And then as a practical sense, you start looking around to say, you know, what do people need? And is there something I can do about it? Um, and so then that may lead to situations in which you serve by leading because that's the best way to, to respond to people's needs. So yeah, I would, from the faith perspective, start with scripture and then look around and see see who needs your help and how best to help them. I'd be happy to have another question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, so earlier you mentioned how it's really good to like ask people questions and talk to them to kind of get their input on a change. So let's say you decide to go a totally different direction than what people suggested. So do you feel like you need to follow up and kind of go back and explain like why you totally aren't doing what they yeah, were absolutely. No, that's a, that's a really good point. So, you know, you go out and you get as much input as you can, and the input will probably be conflicting. Not everybody is likely to tell you the same thing. So you make the best choice, and then you go back and explain to people why you made it. Um, and, you know, the, the ones who wanted you to go to a different direction may not be that happy, but at least they know that you did consider their point of view and why you, you've chosen something different. Oh yeah, you've got to go back and explain <laughs> what, you, what the results of the consultation process were. Good question, thank you.